Hey, we are in the middle of a series entitled Your Verse, and over the last several weeks, you've uh, been given the opportunity to hear individuals share their stories and share how Scripture has intersected with their life because we believe in the power of Scripture. We believe that it's life-changing, life-giving, and that there's freedom found in the Word of God. And so Paul, the, uh, John writes this in Revelations. He says it this way. He says, They triumph over Him by the blood of the Lamb, by what Christ did on the cross for us, and by the word of their testimony. And can I tell you something? We all have a story, and we have a story that's worth telling. And when our story intersects with the story that God's trying to tell inside of our lives, it intersects with Scripture, it radically changes us. It transforms us from the inside out. And so today, we're going to continue on in this series, and we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, We're going to do a little bit of an interview this morning, is I want you to hear the testimony and the story of an individual here in our church that I believe will impact and make a difference inside of your life. And so if you would help me this morning, would you give a warm Victory Hill welcome to Doug McFarland this morning? Would you welcome him to the stage this morning? Come on. Thank you. Amen. Doug, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for uh, taking the opportunity to share your story and to be transparent with us today and uh, what God is doing in your heart and in your life. Uh, Before we get started, I kind of just want to introduce your family a little bit. I think we have a picture of your family, and if you can just kind of help us introduce who some of these people are. Kind of part of them there. Um, It's my wife, uh, my daughter, my daughter-in-law, my son, his girlfriend, my other son, uh, grandson Creighton. And here today is my wife and daughter and my son and his, my, my daughter-in-law and they're, they are grand, one, the, one of the newest grandchildren in Madison. They're all here today, so I'm glad for that. Awesome. Can we give his family a welcome this morning for being here? Amen. <clears throat> Looks like you're a blessed man, Doug. Hey, yes. um, can you just tell, share with the church a little bit? Um, you've been coming to Victory Hill for about a year now, I think is about, about that timeline. Uh, share a little bit how you got here, um, kind of what, how you ended up here, planted here as part of this family. One of the, well, Jim Davison is, one, is a, a big reason. I mean, when I built my house in the first house in, in Lancaster and Dominion in 2003, he was the superintendent. Um, I said earlier today, he wouldn't let me do a whole lot, but he's a great guy. And I will tell you this, <laughs> he's, he's the same consistent Christian you see here today. You see it at work mm-hmm. and you see out on the field and he is not bashful or ashamed of his Lord and Savior and not it meant a lot to me, and um, he invited us here, and we came. And but you got to understand a little bit about I come from a Southern Baptist background, so um, um, we came here. And then my daughter, uh, Bible school, and Bible school is a real important part of our, a part of my life and my story. But um, my daughter started coming with um, uh, uh, some friends, Jordan and, and their family, and they're a big part of why we're here too. Uh, 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 Jason and Rhonda and their family that invited us here. And so the, but my vacation Bible school was how we first started with Madison. It just, it was just such an inviting place. I'd come to pick her up afterwards and um, she just talked about how much she loved it. And, and uh, the people here are so friendly and you are, have welcomed us into, into this church home and I really appreciate it. Amen. And that's just important. Some of the ministries that we do and celebrating how God uses those things to, to continue to reach people and to, to change hearts and ha- change lives. And so I've kind of invited Doug here to kind of share a little bit of his story, his life story. But before we do that, um, we had to kind of plan to share the, the bigger testimony that I want to share in a minute. Uh, but just a couple weeks ago, um, probably about a week and a half ago, there was another testimony that you had um, with, that you were dealing with some heart issues. Can you kind of talk about yeah, that? And what about God's a done? year and a half ago, I had to have a mitral valve replacement, which means they got to open your heart up and exchange the bad valve with the pig valve and uh, everything started was going great and then my heart started beating 720,000 extra beats with moving it and jumping electrical currents across uh, and then stopping and going and so I went to a what they call an electrician in the heart business and um, said we're gonna have to burn part of that off and stop that from doing that and so I went to OSU hospital before I did that, Marvin and all you and, and Jim and just prayed so hard for me, and the church family did. And um, uh, the uh, physician assistants came into the room and said, looked up at the monitor with the EKG, and she said, "Man, your heart's all over the place. We're going to get this fixed." Uh, did everything they needed to do. Said my goodbyes to everybody, and back in the operating room I went, um, which is really intimidating because you're kind of you're awake mm-hmm. before they start putting this stuff and there's screens and monitors and all this stuff and um, 
they put me to sleep and um, stuck a three wires up this way and two wires up this way and um, looked up at the screen and said, we just need to take this back out. He's got a heart of a 30-year-old. I don't know what happened. And they just pulled everything out and uh, took me off. I'm on no heart medicine. Um, and uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 surgeon, the surgeon came in and talked about how that it was, you know, part of what they needed to do was too close to your natural pacemaker that you have in your heart. But uh, he said that uh, there's no jumping across anymore. There's no, still have the extra heartbeats, but it's all upper chamber stuff and I'm going to be fine. It's, it's, so. Amen. Can you give God praise for that, yeah. that healing? And... Church, I, I firmly believe that God still does miracles, you know, but I do believe sometimes we just don't open our eyes to see the miracles that God's performing in front of us. And I just want to encourage you in your own life is just to open your eyes up to the miraculous because I believe that God's still healing. I believe that God's still performing miracles. And sometimes I think in our minds, we think it's about somebody who comes in a wheelchair and leaves walking. And I believe God can still do that, but it's also these natural miracles that are taking place every single day inside of our lives because we serve that big of a God that cares that much about you and he cares that much about me. But that wasn't the, the story that I really wanted Doug to share. About a year ago, about uh, January of this last year, um, I had the opportunity to sit with Doug, and we were actually sitting at uh, Shirky's here in Carroll, uh, the pizza place. And, uh, and Doug just kind of looked at me and goes, hey, can I share my story with you? And uh, he began to share his story, his testimony of what God has done inside of his life. And, and sitting in a little pizza joint here in Carroll, um, Doug's crying. I'm getting all teary-eyed. I'm thinking, man, how awesome and amazing is our God? And, uh, and we got into this Your Verse uh, series. And I said, man, I really want Doug to share um, his story, his testimony, the scripture that, that kind of sustained him through some very difficult seasons of life. Because I believe today in this place, if you'll open up your heart today, I believe that God wants to speak to you, encourage you. I believe that his story may be a part, some of your story in this place today. And, uh, and I think the Holy Spirit's been in this day all day today. Um, and so I just want to pray that you would open up your heart to receive all that God wants to pour into your life today. And so his story starts um, not as a grown adult. It starts as a young child. And actually, we have an old picture of Doug. Man, isn't that a cute little guy? Can, aww. And, no aws, you know, no. I mean, I, guys, I, when it's my kids, aww. I tell you to say aw, so you got to give him an aw, okay? He's going to feel a little bad. Thank you. Okay, you know, make him feel warm <laughs> and welcome there. Uh, but Doug, can you um, kind of talk about your childhood, how, sure. how God worked inside of your life, sustained you, and how this verse has guided you through the years that you're going to share today? Sure. Um, like I said before, Vacation Bible School is such an important part of, of, of my life and how I I, I got involved with with uh, the church and with knowing the Lord as our Savior. I, um, I lived in a, first of all, my mom um, made sure that we went to church. My dad was a very mean, alcoholic, drug user, anything he could take, but he became, he was a very mean man. Um, I kind of got in the way of plans for him. Um, I wasn't part of what his picture was for how he was going to start his married life with my mom. And all of a sudden there I am. And, um, it's very bitter toward me and, um, basically just kind of hated my guts. Um, um, but, and I'll get into that a little bit, but it, going to vacation Bible school, got on a bus, went to a church of Southern Baptist church that no air conditioning, wooden pews, um, but I, I, it was, I got to do things with other Christian people. Um, didn't even know. I lived in a 12 by 50 mobile home, and we had lawn furniture as furniture because my dad drunk all the money away to, to do anything else. It was not the best of shape. It was not clean. There was um, uh, My sister had a bedroom. My mom and dad had a bedroom, and I had a, a floor in a hall um, mm -hmm. because he didn't think I needed a bedroom. Um, so we go to vacation Bible school, and on Friday night, it was the, like a commencement thing, and they would come, and parents would have a program, and parents would come. And um, um, my mom really liked the church, and so we started going to the church. Um, a couple Sunday mornings, my dad would start drinking really early, and by the time it was time for Sunday school, he'd rip the dress off of her or knock her down the hallway, and 
we would still go. But, but guess, guess what we would do? We would hold our head out the car to make sure no one's seen and we cry, and we'd do just like you guys, some of you in here right now do today, walk in here with a smile on your face like everything's okay. There's no problems. Everything's fine. How are you? I'm great. We're wonderful. How are you? We just couldn't be better. And I learned how to do that. I learned how to do that and suffer. I learned how to do that and not let anybody ever know. Um, and we were the poor people at the church. And just like our pastor says, who are you going to give your seat to? I was the kid that Jason talked about two weeks ago that was dirty and stunk and got a school bag. I was that kid. I was the house that got the box of food for Thanksgiving or there wouldn't have been any food that the church provided that just snuck it on the steps. That was me. Yeah. Go to church and we kind of we sit on the back pew. We don't want to be in anybody's way. One deacon named Bud Tope. You can have my seat. You sit with us. I never forgot that. And then when he brought that up, I'm thinking, who am I going to give my seat to? Mm. Who am I going to give it to? Am I going to give it to anybody? But we'd go to church every Sunday, and my dad would just get meaner and, 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 and nine years old. And he thought that you couldn't know the Lord and be a young person, and you didn't know. And, and I, knew I, I knew I was a sinner, just like I am, saved by grace. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I wanted to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and he said, no, hmm. you, that's, you're not going to do that. And... Um, um, they left one Friday night, and um, Billy Graham was on TV. Mm. And Billy Graham showed me how to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen. I didn't need a church. I didn't need music. I, I just needed to get down on my knees and pray the sinner's prayer and invite Jesus Christ into my life. Now, after that, I knew I needed to make it public. I knew I needed to let people know. I need, to, I need to make that outward expression of baptism that we just saw today. I needed to do that. I knew that wasn't going to, that doesn't, didn't do any, what I did when I accepted him did it. That's just an outward appearance of what's yeah. inside me. But I wanted that outward, I wanted that testimony. I wanted everybody to see that. Amen. I was standing on the steps when I was 10 years old on a Sunday morning, and he said, if you go to church today, I will beat you when you come home. Now, beatings then were with a belt, and they were, didn't like, there wasn't just a swat. It was wherever he could hit you till he got tired and couldn't hit you anymore. Um, and my mom said, we don't have to go. We don't have to go today. It's okay. It's okay. He'll, 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 he'll keep drinking, he'll sleep it off, and everything will be fine. And I said, no, I have to go. I have to go. Mm -hmm. The church doors are open. I have to go. And I went to church and sat there and did our songs and the preacher preached and gave an invitation. And I kept hoping and praying someone else would go forward to keep the invitation going longer to sing one more verse of Just As I Am <laughs> so that I could stay at church and not go home because I knew he meant it. I made it to the first step before a backhand come across my face so hard that I fell to the ground. And then he took his belt off and he beat me on the back so hard that it left welt marks. And I turned and it caught me across the forehead and the X's in the belt made an imprint on my forehead. And I went to school on Monday and the teacher went to the principal that I, I didn't know why she went, she went to the principal because the sores on my back were seeping through my shirt and they could see that on my head and um, the principal went in and asked me what happened and told her and they called my mom and dad in and my dad said to the principal if you know what's good for you you'll leave this alone and this was back in the late 60s and she elected just to leave it alone hmm. um, because she was afraid of him like my mom was afraid of him. And people ask all the time, why did your mom stay? Um, he told my mom if she left, he, he would shoot me. Um, and she believed it. Um, 
and to try to keep the timeline straight, at, at, um, I, I wanted to go forward and I couldn't and I wanted to and I didn't and I, I was so worried about not um, and I wanted to be involved in the church. I, di I didn't know what I was supposed to do or how I was supposed to do it. I just knew I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple days before my 11th birthday, um, I went ahead and went forward and made it public and was going to get baptized. And uh, my mom had a birthday party for me for a couple of my friends over. And um, my dad promised he was not going to drink through that, but he did. Um, and um, he said, to do what you want to do at church, you have to be a man. So now you're a man. I'm not going to use a belt on you anymore. It's always going to be my fist. And he told the kids to, they need to leave. He set me in a church chair, the metal chairs. I mean, my legs go underneath of it, set on my hands. And he hit me, I can't tell you how many times with his fist. I will tell you this, after the second or third time, you don't feel it anymore. Hmm. And told me, if this is what I want to do, is it worth it? Is this worth it? Did, did what I'm doing to you now, is it worth it? And I told the pastor when we talked earlier, all the only thing I could say is I'm praying for you. And it made him mad. And he hit me harder. And all I could say is I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I wasn't allowed to make eye contact with my dad after that. Um, my dad moved my sister out of the room, put me in the room. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was able to bring food to the room. I was able to knock on the door and say, um, I, can I go to the restroom and take a bath for school tomorrow? And as long as I didn't make eye contact with him, I could walk through the living room to the bathroom and go back to the bedroom. Now, you got to remember, there's no internet. I had no TV. I had no radio. But I had this. Amen. I had this. And when you're in a confined area for a long, long time, you can read a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was doing the right thing. I knew God was using me and was going to use me. At, a, at that early age, I knew. As time got, as time goes on, I, I still he quit doing the beatings on Sunday mornings, and and and, um, but he just really hated the fact that I'd go to church. But once I went to church, I was at church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night visitation, and I didn't even know at eleven or twelve years old. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to go to visitation as a kid. I didn't know that was just for adults. I just knew the doors was open and I could go. And Bud took me with him. I had no idea that you're supposed to. Like, get to know the people first before you start asking them, do they know the Lord and they know where they're going to go if they went to sleep tonight or if the Lord came back tomorrow? So Bud would talk to the adults, and I would talk to the teenagers or the kids younger than me and older than me, and, and I would just invite them to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen. I, I didn't know you're not supposed to do that at first. I, I, so I, I just did it because I wanted them to have what I had. But I couldn't figure out why in the world I couldn't get this. I couldn't get um, Why was he doing it to me? Why was why was it me? And, and my mom's had a, 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 a gospel song, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather have Jesus than riches and gold. I'd rather have riches, riches than, 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 than mansions. I'd rather have Jesus. And so she, she, she gave me this Bible verse, Ephesians, it's going to be popped up here now, Ephesians 5, 16 through 18. And it says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I just searched so hard, and it meant so much to me. Such, such little verses meant so much to me because, because rejoice always. Pray continually. In all circumstances, give thanks. It's hard to do when that, some stuff like that's happening to you. It's hard to give thanks. Mm -hmm. it's, hard, it's hard to rejoice. It's hard but I knew that was God's perfect will, so it was okay. Amen. It was okay. I knew I was following what he wanted me to do. At the end of the, one of the school years, the principal took me in the office and told me, quit trying so hard, I'm going to end up being just like my dad. And um, there's no need for you to just try to excel. Just, just, you're going to be just like your dad. In fact, I'd had, when my dad would go to rehabilitation because in lieu of going to jail... Um, some of the psychiatrists at the, at the hospital said the same thing. You're, you don't know it yet, but you're him. And I would tell the principal, I'd tell them, you don't know my God. Amen. You don't know that I'm adopted 
child of the King of Kings. You don't, you don't know that you don't know who I am. You don't know how I'm loved. You don't know how I'm forgiven. You don't know me. You don't know my heart. So I just blew that off. None of that meant anything because I know that I was okay and I was doing what I was supposed to do. Yeah. Go through high school at age 17. Uh, I come home from work and my dad had sold everything in the house. You got to keep in mind, at age 10, I had to start paying my own way. So I've been working since I'm 10 years old because um, nothing is free. And if I used, if, if I didn't pay for it, then he had to use money that he could use to drink with or get drugs with to buy stuff for us. So I had to do that. Um, so I was working home and he had sold everything in the house to an auction company and they moved away. And I find myself living in a 1973 Green Gremlin, going to high school, finishing my senior year, sleeping in the back of it at different streets, um, and going to the, the Mr. Bell, the janitor at the high school, let me in to take showers in the morning, and went to the laundromat to wash my clothes, and uh, would go buy bologna and bread and eat that, and, um, and still go to, go to church every day. How you doing? I'm doing great. Great. Half the people didn't even know I was sleeping in my car. Because I'm doing great. Smiles. Everything's good. Everything's good. Just like, just like some of you. I have, some of you had trouble getting here this morning. Some of you had trouble, have, have financial trouble. Some of you have the, some of the same trouble I had today. Earlier today in the first service, standing down there, a lady came up to me and she said, I've been holding this in for 50 years. And I want to talk to you about how I got through that. You see the part up there where it says rejoice always? You know something you can't do? Is you can't rejoice unless you can forgive. Amen. Amen. It will hold you back. It will tie you down. It will rob you from everything. So I had to learn to forgive him for everything. Then I could complete what my mom taught me. I could complete that whole thing. I could rejoice always. Because the freedom that it gave me to forgive him for everything that he'd done to me, I can't even tell you. Do you know how it is, how good you feel when you give someone something and you feel better for giving it than you did for getting it, mm -hmm. than they did for getting it? That's what forgiveness does to you it gives you that joy. Amen. It gives you that peace. Amen. Some of you are dads that, that are just starting out with young kids. Do the right thing. Some of you have had the same situations I'm in. Some of you have had it worse. Some of you are going through some tough stuff right now. Some of you are holding in, for, are holding in bitterness and unforgiveness for 50 years. And she let it go today. Amen. Amen. Had a gentleman come up this morning and said, my dad used to grab me by the throat so I couldn't go to church. It's not just me. Amen. It's not just me. But I can tell you that he loves you. That he wants you to be his child. Amen. That he loves you more than anything. And that if you can forgive and like Paul was talking to the church, if you can forgive and pray continually, you'll be in the perfect will of God. And isn't what we're trying to do? Amen. Isn't it, isn't it, isn't it nice to say it is well with my soul? Mm -hmm. It Amen. is well with my soul? I hope it's well with your soul. Amen. I can tell you this. He's not on the cross. He's not in the grave. Do you know him today? Amen. No matter what your circumstances is, it's not ever bad enough not to. Amen. 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 Can you give Jesus Christ just an ovation of praise in this place today? Amen. As the band and the team gets ready to come and to close us in a song, as I was sitting with Doug and have heard his story, you know, things that stuck out to me is that he never experienced a love from an earthly father, but he was always embraced by his heavenly father. Amen. And for some of you today, that's been your story. 
But you need to know that there's a Heavenly Father that loves you and embraces you right where you're at. Doug mentioned the power of forgiveness inside of our lives, that if you can't forgive, that you can't move forward. And that some of us find ourselves locked up in something inside of our lives because we haven't forgiven, so we can't rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. And, and we go through these seasons and we go through these moments and we don't understand it. Sometimes we don't understand why our dad has to be an alcoholic that beats us and abuses us. We don't understand why we had to marry someone who talked down to us and mentally abused us or verbally abused us or physically abused us. We don't understand it sometimes, but there is purpose in your pain. And we don't have to be defined by the past. Joseph in Genesis, singing about this earlier, in Genesis 50 verse 20 says this, and his brothers came to him and there's this moment, there's this divine moment of forgiveness that we see in scripture. And he says to them, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. That he was in the turnaround story. And Doug's testimony, Doug's story, Doug's verse is about a turnaround story inside of his life. That what the enemy meant to hurt you and to harm you. God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives, yeah, Doug. Absolutely. For the saving the Lord, of many absolutely. lives. Would you stand to your feet with me in this place this morning? And we're going to stand as we get ready to close. And just with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to have Doug pray over us here in a second. But, but here's what I feel like in this place today, that in a moment here, we're going to sing this song. And we're just going to spend a few minutes worshiping. But for some of you, your story looks maybe a little bit, maybe a lot like Doug's. Maybe it's something that happened with your father that that's put just kind of a wedge between you and your heavenly father because there's just this unforgiveness inside of your life. For some of you, maybe you find yourself kind of like in a mental prison today because of circumstances that happened to you. Maybe it was a family member, or a husband, or a wife that said something over you. And, and to be honest with you, you've never forgiven them. You've never let that go. And it's kept you just locked up this morning. And to be honest, if you were to be honest in this place, there's some hatred, there's some hurt, there's some bitterness inside of your life. And you can't live out that reverse. Rejoice always. Pray continually. But this is God's perfect will for your life because, man, there's just something that is hindering you. And I pray today in this place by the power of the Holy Spirit of God that just as we saw in first service that some of you today would, would lay some of those things down that, that there would be just a sense of a weight that is lifted off of you. For some of you, you're just so mentally bogged down because of something that happened to you that you can't move forward. That's not God's plan for your life. Doug is a living testimony the power of God that can be at work in every single one of our lives, that we are saved by the blood of the Lamb, the power of our testimony, the power of the story of what Christ has done inside of us. So I'm going to have Doug pray over us. And then if that's you here today, man, if you're just dealing with something, if you're dealing with a weight, you're dealing with some pressure inside of your life, and you're struggling to rejoice in this season of life, I want to encourage you to come and as we sing, to just come to this altar and allow us to lay hands on you and pray with you and agree with you that God, the God that we serve, has the ability to set you free. Doug, would you pray over us today?